people. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm San Francisco Mayor London Breed, and I am so excited. Thank you to, I think, the members of the Board of Supervisors joining us today. I see uh, Asha Safai. I see the Budget Chair, Matt Haney. I see Raphael Mandelman. Thank you all for joining us as well as our treasurer, Jose Cisneros, our assessor recorder, Joaquin Torres, our district attorney, Chesa Bodine, and I'm not sure, I think I got all the elected officials here. Thank you so much. Good afternoon to all the community members, the city staff, to our elected officials. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be here. Not, not just because we are announcing that we have officially balanced our latest two-year budget, so oh, that is important. No, I'm happy because I'm here in Chinatown in front of actual people again, and it feels great. This is the first time in so long that I've seen so many familiar faces, kinda. I think I recognize you all. Over the past few weeks, San Francisco has really started to open up. You can see it everywhere. People are going to museums, to baseball games, enjoying the incredible outdoor dining spaces, and families in our parks and playgrounds, like this one that we are at today, Willy Woo Woo Wong. I had the opportunity to go to the symphony, symphony last week, and yes, the performance was incredible, but just being at Davie Symphony Hall was magic. It was San Francisco coming back to life. People are excited for what's coming, and I'm excited to be here today with all of you. I want to recognize my budget chair, or my budget director, Ashley Goffenberger, and her incredible team. Thank you for the hours and hours of work you put into working with labor to community stakeholders and our city departments to get this budget balanced and delivered on time. Now, I have always believed in what this city can do, but standing here today, I am more confident than ever in our ability to rise and to deliver. Because over the last year, I've seen what we can do. All of us, we've been tested like never before. Our spirit, our resilience, and our compassion for one another have all been tested. The past year has been hard. We've all been tired. We've been worn down. We've faced challenges with our mental health. Our kids have suffered. Our seniors have suffered. Our outlook at times was pretty dark. But through it all, we held it together. And now today gathered together at Willy Woo Woo Wong Playground, we are in the light. No, COVID is not gone, but the number of people in the hospital is lower than it's been since March of last year. And almost 80% of eligible people have been vaccinated. Thanks to the hard work of so many, thanks to our healthcare providers, our community partners, our city workers, and the people of this city, I can finally declare with pride and confidence that we are literally out of the woods. But keep your mask on. Now, we haven't done this alone. We have had strong support from the state and federal government, including Governor Gavin Newsom, who has led California and delivered for our workers, our small businesses, and our most vulnerable residents through programs like Project Home Key. And thanks to the American Rescue Plan put forward by our President Joe Biden, our Vice President Kamala Harris, and the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, we don't have a crushing budget deficit. 
thanks to all of those folks. What we do have, however, is an opportunity, an opportunity to take all that we've lived through and all the lessons that we've learned and focus on what really matters. That's what this budget is about. It's about fulfilling the many promises we made, delivering on fundamental change and lifting up our entire city. Now we are here in Chinatown because we know this neighborhood was hit first and it was hit hard. February is normally an amazing time for this community when the Lunar New Year celebrations bring visitors from all over the world. But in February of last year, things were really dark. The Lunar New Year parade was canceled. Tourists disappeared. Small businesses were struggling and the streets were empty. And in the months since then, this neighborhood has continued to suffer from the loss of visitors, yes, but also from the disgusting xenophobia and shocking acts of violence. Seniors are afraid to leave their homes to run errands. Families worried about their safety. What is happening right now, in particular, the attacks against our elders is shameful for our city. It is shameful for our country. Just last week, I was out to lunch at RNG Lounge down the street from here with a woman named Miss Wong. After my grandmother passed away, Miss Wong became my adopted grandmother. She's so warm and kind, but just like my grandmother, you don't want to get on her bad side. And she fills me with such joy when I see her. She tells me she's proud of me and she shows me pictures of her grandchildren. She is truly a beautiful spirit and she's joining us here today. Thank you, Miss Wong. That's my baby, y'all. You mess with Miss Wong, you mess with me. When I see these attacks against our Asian seniors, I think of my grandmother. I think of Ms. Wong. I think of how I feel if someone would lay their hands on them. I know so many of us feel that way here today. And it breaks my heart every single time. An attack against one of us is an attack on all of us. And San Franciscans, we will rise to the occasion to protect our seniors by any means necessary. I've been proud to stand with leaders like Assemblymember David Chu and Phil Ting to not only call for unity against these racist attacks, but to bring forward solutions to support our residents and to send a clear message. The disgusting attacks against our API community must end now, and that doesn't just mean having more law enforcement on our streets. It means continuing and expanding programs like our community guardians. These multiracial street patrol teams are walking the streets and neighborhoods like this one in Visitation Valley and in the Inner Richmond, the Tenderloin, San Bruno Avenue and other areas. They know the community, they are from these communities and they are bridging cultural divides, building relationships and watching out for the most vulnerable. This is exactly the kind of program my budget will invest in. It means continuing to fund the Senior Escort Program, which is serving members of this community. We are also launching ambitious plans to have community ambassadors up and down mid the Mid-Market Corridor and across all of downtown and our waterfront. Again, these are ambassadors who are watching our blocks, call, making calls for services for those who are struggling, giving directions to those who are lost, offering a friendly face to those who are in need. But let's be clear, keeping our city safe also does require law enforcement. That means making sure we have officers on our streets, walking the beats and responding to crimes. Right now, every year we lose about 80 officers who either retire or leave the force for other reasons. If we don't replace these officers with new recruits, our police force will shrink. We will lose footbeats. We won't be able to quickly respond to 911 calls. We won't be able to make arrests to hold people accountable. That will not make our city safe. So in this budget, we are proposing two police academy classes to keep our ranks stable. 
The good news is, the good news is, as we add these academy classes, our police force is also becoming more diverse. Since 2009, the proportion of recruits in our classes have increased from the black community by 45%, the Latino community by 78%, and the Asian community by 79%. Removing the bias starts right there by making sure the people in uniform reflect and understand the communities they serve. And we know that we can't stop every crime and sadly, there will be victims in our city. But I want all residents and visitors to feel safe when they step forward to report a crime, especially our seniors. So we are creating a new Office of Justice Innovation that will coordinate the city's response to victims across all communities, including with targeted support from the, for the API community. This new team will also continue our groundbreaking work to find more effective ways to respond to people when they call from help, no matter what neighborhood you live in. Our street crisis response team is already taking our most challenging mental health calls. The people who too often end up in bad situations when confronted by law enforcement. We've got four teams already out on the streets with two more coming soon. And we are adding a seventh team in this budget. Why? Because these teams are working. I've seen the results myself. A few weeks ago, I went out with a street crisis response team. We arrived on the scene in Fisherman's Wharf to find a man with no shoes, clearly in need of care, talking to himself, walking in and out of traffic, the kind of lost soul too many of us have seen too often and wondered, why is no one doing anything? Why? A police officer had arrived on the scene first, but when the street crisis response team showed up, I could see the relief in the officer's eyes. He knew he wasn't the one for this call. He knew there was a better way. It took time, over an hour and multiple conversations but eventually, that gentleman ended up getting care from paramedics and a clinician. It didn't end in violence or everyone just walking away. Better solutions deliver better outcomes. That's how we make a difference. And now in this budget, we are expanding our street response teams to include wellness teams composed of a paramedic and a homeless outreach worker that will respond to even more calls that would better benefit from a non-police response. And we're also adding street overdose response teams to help curb the crisis of overdoses in our city. Fentanyl is destroying lives, not just here in San Francisco, but across the country. That's why we will continue to push for overdose prevention programs with the help of Senator Scott Weiner at the state level. And we will expand our street medicine team and treatment programs that have been effective in preventing overdoses and helping people get off opioids and meth. As we increase these services, we also need to continue to enforce all laws against drug dealing. Our police officers are on pace to see seize more fentanyl this year than ever before. We need every level of our criminal justice system to step in to stop this drug dealing from torturing, especially the people in the Tenderloin and other neighborhoods in this city. Our residents and those who are suffering on the streets, they deserve better. And as we change how we respond to people on the streets, we also need places for them to go. We can have all the outreach teams in the world, but if we don't have housing, shelter, and treatment beds, we are going to see those same people right back on the streets again and again and again. But the good news is, it's taken a lot of work, but we have a plan. Starting with treatment beds, in this budget, we are funding the acquisition and operation of over 340 new treatment beds.
And we have set aside funding to acquire facilities for up to 300 more treatment beds so we can keep growing our pipeline. That's a plan for 640 new beds on top of the over 2,000 beds we already have. That is real change. That is a long-term difference. So when we see someone in need or when we have a family member who's suffering, we can have some place for them to go and to get healthy so people can heal instead of falling apart right in front of our eyes. We are taking the same approach with our homeless recovery plan, which will create more permanent supportive housing and places for people to go. This plan, which launched last year, calls for at least 6,000 placements for people by July of 2022, including, I know I'm excited about it too, <laughs> including the largest expansion of permanent supportive housing in 20 years. And this plan is already working. We have fewer people living in tents on our streets than at the height of the pandemic, than even before the pandemic. And we are moving people out of shelter-in-place hotels right now into permanent supportive housing. Each of these stories is a success and a life change. People like the vulnerable senior with schizophrenia who had been homeless in the mission for 45 years. Let's call him Tyrone. Not call Tyrone, but let's call him Tyrone. Some of you got that. Thank you. Our homeless outreach workers have known Tyrone for a long time, but it wasn't until they got him into a hotel and connected to services that he began to relax, that he had the opportunity to heal. After many attempts of housing offers, Tyrone recently moved into permanent supportive housing. Think about it, 45 years homeless and now he's housed permanently. That's almost longer than I've been alive. Actually, that kind of is longer than I've been alive, kind of. So yes, our homeless recovery plan is working. But this, with this budget, we are pushing beyond that goal. Over the next two years, between local, state, and federal funding, we are putting in over a billion dollars into action in San Francisco to address this. This is an historic investment which will allow us to provide up to 4,000 more new placements to get people off the streets, including 1,000 new units of permanent supportive housing in addition to the 1,500 units we already have. We will add two new safe parking sites and create a new 40-bed emergency shelter for families. And we will serve over 7,000 households with prevention services because we know keeping people housed is the easiest way to end homelessness. More housing, more placements, more people living indoors. Yes, this is a historic investment for our city, but we have to be honest with ourselves. If we're gonna see change on our streets, it takes more than money. We also have to have the will to make the change. So to be clear, we will lead with services to get people housing and the help that they need for those with complex needs, we will do everything we can to assist them and get them on the path of recovery. We know it's not easy, but that's our commitment. And for those exhibiting harmful behavior, whether to themselves or to others, or are those refusing assistance, we will use every tool we have to get them into treatment and services, to get them indoors. We won't accept people just staying on the streets when we have a place for them to go. If we focus and invest right, we have a real chance to make a fundamental change for those who are living on the streets, for our city as a whole. We also know that our recovery isn't just about getting back to where we were. It's about taking on the existing disparities laid bare by this pandemic. We saw the devastating impacts on our Latino community, those who lived in crowded conditions, who didn't have access to health care, who had no choice but to go to work, who didn't have a lot of trust in government. We saw the systemic racism many of us have known all too well for far too long in the African-American community, exposed by COVID and by the murder of George Floyd. We saw our transgender community suffer 
from disproportional impacts. We saw our young people devastated and women pushed out of the workforce at higher rates than men when our schools shut down. We witnessed all of this and it's clear we have a duty to commit to an equitable recovery. And we will continue our historic investments in the African-American community by continuing to fund the Dream Keepers Initiative. We will make sure our recovery has dedicated community responses that includes $57 million to fund programs in impacted communities, to deliver on workforce, small business support, economic relief, food security, testing, vaccines, and mental health support, community resource hubs, arts, culture, and recreational programs, all the things that got us through this. We will build on our guaranteed income pilot programs that are already moving forward by adding a new program to deliver payment to members of our transgender community. Our Women and Family First initiative will offer job training to women and free childcare so that they can get back in the workforce. We will also fund mental health support for our public school students and continue our Opportunities for All program, which is providing our young people with paid internships and setting them on the path to success. We, we are backfilling our lost hotel taxes to ensure that the arts and artists can continue to thrive, Deborah Walker. And we are setting aside funding to purchase a site for the LGBT Cultural Museum. So we finally have a home to celebrate all those that fought for equity in this city, Supervisor Mandelman. We are funding affordable housing, improving playgrounds like this one we stand in today, improving our streets and replacing aging city infrastructure. We are investing in our transportation system, delivering over $90 million to support muni and bike and pedestrian safety projects. Because if we don't have a fully functional transportation system, people won't be able to get around in this city. And of course, we are making sure that our COVID response is still funded because we know we still need testing, outbreak management, shelter in place hotels, and to feed and support those who are in need for months ahead. Like I said, we are out of the woods, but one thing we've learned over the last year, we never know what lies ahead. This pandemic did not give us notice and neither will the next earthquake. That's why we have to do the hard work to prepare. Remember over the last year during the worst of our budget, we did not have to lay off any city workers because we had a strong reserve to carry us through. So we are taking the opportunity now today to maintain our reserves for the next downturn. We were so lucky to receive the tremendous support from the federal government to help stabilize us but there are still challenging times ahead. I know responsibility doesn't grab headlines, but it's what leaders do. We don't raid our reserves unnecessarily so. We protect and we grow them. That's how we will weather any challenge that comes our way because we are a resilient city. The people of this city are strong and resilient. The people of this neighborhood, Chinatown, they are strong and resilient. It's in their history, the oldest Chinatown in the country. After the 1906 earthquake and fire, almost all of Chinatown, like much of San Francisco, burned to the ground. At that time, there were people from outside this community who said, let's move Chinatown down to the southeast part of the city or across the river to Oakland. But you know who disagreed with them? The people who lived here, the people who loved their homes, their neighborhood, their community, the people who knew this was a proud place 
built by those who came before and would welcome those who came after. So the people in Chinatown fought to stay. They fought for their home and they won. And out of the ashes of that great fire, they rebuilt this incredible neighborhood. That's the story of Chinatown and it's the story of San Francisco. Not even a global pandemic can knock us out. San Francisco is coming back. With this budget, with these investments, we have a path to get us to where we need to be. But it's the people of this city that will propel us to the place that we know we need to go. Our spirit will carry us forward. Through these challenging times, that's what's held us together. San Francisco isn't going anywhere except straight ahead into what I see is a bright and hopeful future. I am so excited to work with each and every one of you to make sure that our city continues to shine. We've been through earthquakes, we've been through fires, We've been through challenges. Now we can check off the global pandemic box. And guess what, San Francisco? After we get this budget passed and we move these dollars into action, we are gonna see real change and things are gonna look better and brighter than even before the pandemic. You all are an important part to thank in these efforts. So thank you all, looking forward to see this budget pass through the Board of Supervisors.